His iconic book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, had transformed the understanding of many people around the world because it, for the first time, really exposed the origination of our monetary system, how it came to be, and what the implications are for people like you and I that go to work every day. In his mid-80s, his mind is still as sharp as a tack. He kept me on my toes. You're going to find this interview very, very stimulating. So let me introduce to you my interview with G. Edward Griffin. Ed, I'm a big fan of your work, so I've been anticipating and looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for taking the time. Well, it's a pleasure to hear that, Pat. Thank you very much. So your book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, I read several years ago, and I was mesmerized by it and also kind of shocked as far as its contents and what it you know, revealed or exposed. So uh, let me ask you this. What, what got you started to want to even write that book or approach that project? You know, um, Patrick, it's like so many things in life. If you knew where you were headed, you probably wouldn't take that path. Right. I thought I was going someplace else. And um, I really didn't have an interest in the Federal Reserve. Back in, back in the day when I was very young and I was trying to make a difference in the world, the one thing I had uh, had a little experience with as a very young person was uh, media. Mm-hmm. I worked in a television station. I was an assistant director, floor manager, and all that stuff. And I, I took speech and communications at the university, and I had a radio program and all that. So mm-hmm. I thought, this is what I do. So I will put the communication skills that I had learned to work and tell people what I was learning. Mm-hmm. Well, that came a little bit later. You see, first when I came out of school, I thought I was going to be a big splash in Hollywood. Right. right? <laughs> That's why the world was obviously waiting for me. <laughs> and, uh, so when I got there, it was a, a really rude awakening. I discovered that there were a lot of people there with much better talent than mine. Right. And they were waiting tables and washing cars, waiting for their big chance. Right. But this time, I had married my uh, childhood sweetheart, my college sweetheart. She was the prettiest nurse on campus. We had a child, and we were, you know, on the road. And all of a sudden, I was running out of money, (laughs) and nobody cared about me. (laughs) It was a really rude awakening. So I went to work for a large corporation, and I was doing well. I was climbing the corporate ladder and all of that. So my shift, uh, my life had shifted to now, okay, I'm in the real world now. Mm -hmm. Not this Hollywood stuff, but the real world. And uh, it was in that stage, I was about five years with this corporation. I was, you know, thinking about what I was going to be and how high I could climb the ladder and I'm going to be a vice president and I'm going to have all these nice material things and provide for my family and all of that, like most young people do. And then I began to read some stuff and hear some things about what was going on in the world Mm -hmm. that upset me. And I didn't know I had one, but my crusader gene kicked Mm -hmm. in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, these things that I thought were important began to fade. Mm-hmm. And I began to think about, well, wait a minute, this, this beautiful country, which I was born into, which I thought would always be here because that's the way it is, right. I realized that it was, uh, had some problems and that there were people who didn't want the way it was. They mm-hmm. wanted to change it to something else. And the deeper I got into it, the more alarmed I became. And this is when the crusader gene kicked in, is I have to do something about right. it. And so, um, make a long story short, I quit my job. Wow, my poor like wife that. almost. <laughs> that was, um, what are you doing? What, you know, how are we going to live? So I thought, well, look, I, I know these skills. I'm going to start producing some little documentary films. Mm-hmm. And at that stage, I decided that I wanted to do something on inflation. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about it, except I thought there was a lot of uh, nonsense about the cause of inflation. Mm-hmm. Nobody re- really seemed to know. They were pointing the finger at the other guy. And I thought, this can't be true. So I started to do some research and got some boxes full of papers and books and recordings. And I interviewed some people, some bankers and mm-hmm. so forth. But then uh, there was a group in Pasadena, mm-hmm. typical little old ladies in tennis shoes in Pasadena that you may have heard about, mm-hmm. and they had a study group mm-hmm. on taxes, mm. high taxes, okay. And they called me. They heard I was giving speeches uh-huh. and free speeches at that. <laughs> so they wanted to know if I would come and speak to their group about taxes. And I told the ladies there, I said, well, you know, with the one lady in who was in charge of it, I said, well, I don't know much about taxes, but I might have something on a hidden tax. Hmm. She said, well, what's that? I said, well, that's what I would talk about. Mm-hmm. Well, they went for that, of course, and uh, so I came and I talked about the hidden tax mm-hmm. called 
inflation. Mm. And of course, you don't do any research on that at all without getting quickly to the source, the engine of the inflation right. and the expansion of the money supply. And that's the Federal Reserve System. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was. At, that's how I sort of eased into it. I had no intention of becoming any kind of an authority, except I had my box full of papers and <laughs> research, <laughs> and I could talk a little bit on it. Right. Well, the group was so impressed by it, and they said, well, that was wonderful. You ought to take that on the road. Uh -huh. you know? Well, the one thing you don't say to a budding young public speaker is take it on the road because he will take it on the road. <laughs> and so I did. Yeah. I started to put on some seminars right. called the Crash Course on Money. Mm. And they were well attended and we were having, a, we felt that we were doing some good, teaching mm. people about the basics of money, inflation in particular, mm. how to protect yourself against that and mm -hmm. so forth. And increasingly though, people asked me at the end of these seminars, mm. in the Q&A period in particular, they said, well, my husband died some years ago and we have a small estate and I don't know what to do with the money. Should I buy an apartment building? Should I buy gold or silver? Should I get out of debt or go into debt and get income and so forth? And I discovered at that point that I was a fraud mm -hmm. because I didn't know anything about that. I mm -hmm. knew about inflation and how the central bank worked and the Federal Reserve, but these were real life questions about the market right. and I knew nothing about it. So I stopped doing the seminars and I enrolled in a school, a College for Financial Planning in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. which was, uh, I didn't want to become a financial planner, that was not it, but I thought, if I'm going to talk about this topic, I don't know about the real world of markets. Right. So I went through that and got my designation and then I was getting very serious about this topic because I was learning more as I went. Mm -hmm. The best way to learn about something is to try and explain it. Right. I agree with that. <laughs> because then you realize where your holes are. You have to right. go and fill in the holes. So by this time, I had filled in so many holes, I felt I really should write a book on right. this. Mm -hmm. That point was the beginning of a seven-year project of research and wow. writing. Wow. So I quit the process twice. Mm -hmm. It was the dark night, you know. Yeah. I said, this is too big. There's too much. I'm, I'm inadequate to do this. I'll never finish this. Mm -hmm. So I quit. But there was something in me, that crusader turn, who <laughs> said, no, 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 you can't quit. So I went back and I finally finished it. Mm -hmm. So if I had known how long it would take and how much effort it was and so many years with uh, really jeopardizing our family because when you're writing, you're not making any money, that's right. you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it and uh, I'm glad I did, of course. And uh, it seems like all of the projects I've gotten into have been along similar paths. They mm -hmm. zigzag around mm -hmm. and I... I've discovered talking to people that most most of us have traveled those zigzag paths in yeah. our lives. Yeah. So was there a, a certain point in time when you're in the research part of this book and, you, and you're writing it that where it was like an aha moment, like, oh my God, there's something that seems, you know, somewhat conspiratorial here. Or was it just incremental, like it just kept building on itself? Uh, like, was there like that flashpoint where it's like suddenly, wow. This is, this is not what I thought, and it, it's a story that needs to be told. A little bit of both, uh, Patrick. I think, first of all, it was basically incremental. Mm -hmm. But there were two little flashpoints that happened that, I'm, that I can think of right now. Uh, the first one was when I realized that the Federal Reserve System was created in secret. Mm -hmm under conditions of extreme secrecy. There are very few wars in history that were launched under conditions of greater secrecy than mm -hmm. the Fed. And I was aware that, you know, you don't do things in secret unless you have something to hide. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that caught me and kept bringing me back to that iconic meeting that took place on Jekyll Island, which was a private club island in Georgia where right. all of these, these bankers went to get out of the public eye. Mm -hmm. And they spent a week creating the Federal Reserve System in this private place in Georgia on an and, island. And what year was that? That was uh, 1910. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that idea of what were they trying to hide kept drawing me to it. I knew there was something important mm -hmm. because it was more than just the history of how this thing came about. I, I began to realize that I was dealing with not the dull story of banking and discount rates and mm -hmm. the history of who did this and so forth, but it was like a whodunit. Mm -hmm. And so that was my mission is to show who did it and how they did it and where they buried the body mm -hmm. and what it means to you and to me. So that was one aha moment. And the other aha moment came many 
many moons later, mm -hmm. when I finally got near the end of the project and I began to get very nervous mm -hmm. about the idea of putting my work out into the world mm -hmm. to be scrutinized by people who would disagree with me. Right. Many of whom, of course, were far quali more qualified than I. Right. They were you know, professors, they were teachers, they were academics, they mm -hmm. were bankers, they were business people. And uh, they had all of these credentials, and I thought, oh, they're gonna chop me up in little pieces, you know. Mm -hmm. I've made a lot of mistakes, I'm sure. But it was a certain point right at the end, and I began to get into debates with mm -hmm. some of these academics. Mm -hmm. I thought they were gonna tear me apart on radio and so right, forth. Right. And the, the second one came when I, I walked into a radio studio, and I'd forgotten where it was, it was back in the East Coast. And I thought it was gonna be an interview on my work. Mm -hmm. But instead, there was a guy sitting on the other side of the table, and he was introduced to me as Professor So-and-so from the local university, mm -hmm. and that this was going to be a debate. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, no, no time to prepare. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. this yeah. is where I'm going to be unmasked right, you know, right, right. as a fool. <laughs> right. So I thought, okay, here we go. So the first part of the program was, well, Mr. Griffin, would you tell us what you have found and what your theory is about all this? So I made my statement, and I think I had about two or three minutes to summarize it. And it was not very... Uh, it was not very kind toward the banking system. Mm -hmm. And then, well, Professor So-and-so, what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. I was waiting on the <laughs> my seat. And there was a long pause. And he said, well, what you say is true, but we're living well, aren't we? <laughs> That's the response? That was the response. Oh, my goodness. And that was the moment I knew I had hit the bullseye. Right. If the worst thing they could say is that, well, everything you say is true. It's okay, yes, yes we're, tr we're cheating people. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're financing wars. Yes, we're destroying the system. Yes, we're all these horrible things, but we're living well, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was it. That's, uh, <laughs> that would be a pivotal moment. Yeah, it was pivotal. <laughs> so let's review some of that then for people maybe who aren't familiar with the story. Uh, and I'm, I was curious too, it's who documented that meeting in Jekyll Island? How were you able to find out who was there and what they talked about? Because it was a secretive meeting. Well, Patrick, that was a lot easier than mm -hmm. you might think because they documented it themselves. Right. Now, in the beginning, there was a lot of secrecy, as I said, and they didn't uh, talk about it openly, but they were keeping their diaries mm -hmm. and their families knew about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, after the Federal Reserve was actually formed and, uh -huh. and uh, was becoming a, an iconic, popular institution, wonderful American institution. Mm -hmm. Then they began to speak openly about it. Say, yes, we really went there, and this mm -hmm. is what we did. And they seemed to be competing with each other in a way as to who was the most credit. important person in this. Yeah. <laughs> in the beginning, though, they denied that there mm -hmm. was any such meeting that took place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was, and then, of course, they started to write articles about it and give speeches about it. Right. And, one of them wrote a book about it, mm -hmm. and uh, their historians uh, recounted the story as told by the family and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of very uh, credible sources now, mostly original sources, that are in the public libraries if you want to dig for them. Mm -hmm. I found almost everything I needed in the public domain. Mm -hmm. I went to Jekyll Island and found some interesting tidbits in their archives. Uh -huh. uh, they make no bones about it. You right. can go to Jekyll Island now, go to the clubhouse, and there's the picture on the wall of all these guys. <laughs> and on the door that goes into the room where they held this meeting, it says uh, Federal Reserve Room. Wow. And there are their pictures, and they it's sort of, hey, this is where the Federal Reserve was created, you know? Wow. Well, of course, they don't go into the the idea that they were trying to hide something. It's just that this, isn't it nice that these famous gentlemen were here and members of our club. Right. So, and so let's talk about what were they trying to hide and what, you know, what, what was the real intention behind the formation of the Federal Reserve and how has it impacted our lives through those generations since? Well, we're gonna skip over a lot of old history that, mm -hmm. about the evolution of banking and all of that. We come fast forward through all that vital information so you can really appreciate what's going on today because this isn't the first time. Mm -hmm. Everything that's happening today has happened before mm -hmm. in history. So what we find is that prior to the Federal Reserve System, there was, you might call it banking chaos mm -hmm. in the United States and around the world for mm -hmm. that matter, but we're talking about the U.S. Each of the states had created uh, official state banks. Mm -hmm. And in the process of creating these banks, the states gave them permission to do things 
that were really unethical. Right. Under the promise that, well, we're going to regulate them to make sure that these unethical and, and these otherwise illegal things don't hurt anybody. Right. Because we, the trustworthy politicians, are going to be watching this, so don't <laughs> worry about it. And what am I talking about? Basically, what they gave them was the power to create money out of nothing mm. and to charge interest on nothing. Mm. And they gave them the power to imply, and in some cases openly state, that they were holding reserves of the depositors, mm -hmm. holding them, and they called them demand deposits, which meant that you could come in and demand your money because it was there. Right. When in fact, that was a lie mm -hmm. because they had taken that money and they had loaned it out and mm -hmm. it wasn't there at mm -hmm. all. You could not demand it. The first 3% that got there could demand it and they got it and mm -hmm. the rest were... Uh, we don't have any. Right. And they were allowed basically to lie about that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not how the language came out. You know, you read it. It was written by lawyers, so it sounded pretty good. But in essence, there were, there were things like that existing in all of the state banks. And so consequently, the banks were expanding the money supply mm -hmm. based on loans mm -hmm. and not cash deposits at all, which made them very precarious when there were runs on the bank. Right. And so the banks had to close their doors. People lost their savings because of this basically an unethical arrangement that existed. It would have been different if they had said, well, we're going to loan your money out so you can't demand it. Right. And, um, and maybe we'll lose your money, too. Mm -hmm. But they didn't say that. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to be secure. There. That's yeah, secure. why you bring it to a bank. That's yeah. the bank. It's yeah. secure. You know, right. They didn't realize they were, they were lending their money to speculators. Right. And not, I mean, bankers are speculators. Right. And so, so that was the situation. A lot of banks were failing. And so there was a national movement to reform banking in America. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people wanted to have Congress there their elected representatives step up as their defender and pass a law mm -hmm. that would control these big bad bankers and prevent these runs on the bank and all and loss of savings and all that. So the banks, the biggest banks, especially in New York, which dominated the whole scene, decided that rather than wait for a real genuine response from the public to mm -hmm. reform the banking industry, that they themselves would get at the head of the parade. Right. And they would be the leaders of the cry for banking reform. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what happened, but they didn't want the public to know it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to control both sides of the debate. So the biggest bankers of them all mm -hmm. were the ones that drafted the Federal Reserve Act, which was supposed to be to control the banks. So the banks themselves, the biggest violators, the biggest cause of all the public alarm, decided that they would draft the reform right. to reform themselves, yeah, of the, course. The, the fox is guarding the hen house, The basically. fox is going to create, the, build the hen house, <laughs> install the security system, and guard it. <laughs> but they, see, yeah. they didn't dare let the public know that they were the ones creating it. That's why they had to go away from Washington, D.C., and they, they didn't allow any politicians. There was all the bankers. That oh, went, no politicians were on No politicians. Oh, okay. There was an assistant secretary of the Treasury mm -hmm. uh, who was there. He, why was he assistant secretary of the Treasury? He was a banker. Right. In real life, he right. was a banker. Mm -hmm. So they were all bankers, you see. Yeah. And they created this thing called the Central Bank or the Federal Reserve System mm -hmm. in secret because mm -hmm. if the public had known that the reform legislation was written by the bankers, they would never have gone for it. It's right. that simple. So in essence, they're saying well, you know, they're trying to self-govern rather than have the government gover govern them. They'd get together and do it themselves, but they're conflicted as far as you know how they would govern or what rules there would be. So what were some of the outcomes that have had these downstream adverse effects? Well, first of all, your, your observation is correct. Mm -hmm. They wanted to self-govern, mm -hmm. but it's, that's kind of a gentle way of mm -hmm. describing it. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a real name for that kind of an arrangement, and it's called a cartel. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's another one I've heard. <laughs> yeah, and that's really what they formed. Yeah. The, uh, the Federal Reserve System is a cartel of mm -hmm. banks. Mm -hmm. in, in essence, it's no different than the, than the oil cartel or the mm -hmm. banana cartel right. or any other sugar cartel. Right. You get all the producers together, the big producers, and they decide to form an, uh, an industry-wide association. They regulate themselves, and if they're really smart, which most of them are, they bring the politicians into it, yes. and they take their, their cartel agreement 
and they pass it into law, right. and they call it reform, yeah. or to protect the people, or they give it some nice words. That also can be known as collusion. It's collusion. <laughs> right. In other words, they, they use government mm -hmm. to enforce their own private cartel agreement. Right. And we see that happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Federal Reserve is one of the most major examples of that. But we see it in healthcare. We see it in the utilities industry. We yes. see it everywhere you look. These are cartels right. that bring the government into it and make it look like they're serving the people because government's involved. But in fact, the governments are serving the private interests. Right. This is an important thing to understand. Very important. Things. Very important. So now it's formed. It, it comes into existence. And it's sort of interesting because it's not a government uh, agency. Not at all. It's a private yes. entity mm -hmm. that is under government, I guess, would you say regulation or uh, review? Or what, what is the accountability of the Federal well, Reserve to the government? As I said a moment ago, they take their cartel agreement, they take it, to, in our case, to Congress. Mm -hmm. Congress uh, stamps it, says we vote for it, now it's law. Mm -hmm. So now you and I have to abide by the rules of the cartel or we go to prison. Right. Because it's law. And because we go to prison, if we violate it, it makes us think that, well, it must be a government agency because yeah. only government can put you in prison, right? Right. Well, not unless the agency has been captured by the private right. sector, you see. Mm -hmm. Now it's not that way at all. It's upside down the other way. Mm -hmm. So that's really what's happening. It's not a government agency, mm -hmm. but it appears to be a government agency because it has the power of government to enforce it. And that's what makes it hard for people to understand. It's got to be government, doesn't it? And it's not at all. It's a private banking cartel. And who were some of the key people that were there at Jekyll Island? Senator Nelson Aldridge, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the uh, first one. He's the guy that owned the private railroad car, by the mm -hmm. way, oh, wow. where all these guys got into a private railroad car in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, and they traveled for two nights and a day up to... Uh, down the coast to uh, Georgia, uh -huh. and they got off, and they went across the inland straits to uh, Jekyll Island. Now he was a senator. Was he a sitting senator or a former senator? Oh, he was a sitting senator. Okay, so then he, he yeah. was, there was a politician there. Oh, there I guess. was. He was a politician. Okay. Well, yep, yeah, he was a banker. He was a banker yeah, also. Well, yeah. He was. He's a close business associate of J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. and and William Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. This is his. His, this was his financial base. Right. He was more of a businessman and a banker than he was a politician. Right. You see. But nevertheless, he was in charge of the Senate commission mm -hmm. that was given the responsibility to come up with a proposal, yeah. a banking reform. Uh -huh. So he was just the perfect guy for yeah. it. He's a business partner with the biggest moguls in the right. world. Right. And uh, so he selected uh, the right people. He went to Europe and he went on a fact-finding mission and all that kind of stuff. But he knew exactly what he was looking for. Were all the people there Americans, or were there some Europeans at this meeting? No, also? at this meeting, they're all Americans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is very much a, an American institution. Mm -hmm. Now, you get into some, some shady stuff where we know that there was foreign money involved. Mm -hmm. We know that the, the Rothschild banking dynasty was very interested in mm -hmm. and, and very probably financially involved in mm -hmm. this, although it's hard to find out. You right. know, they don't publish those records. Right, right. But we, we know that the firm of uh, Kuhn Loeb and Company mm -hmm. um, was represented, and they represented the Rothschilds in um, England and France, mm -hmm. and then there was the Warburg family in uh, Germany mm -hmm. and uh, in France, I believe, and they were represented there. So we know there was fin financial interest from outside, but all of these people were, were associated with the Morgan Bank mm -hmm. or the Rockefeller Bank. In fact, the Morgan Bank had two people there, mm -hmm. and one was the investment trust and one was the banking industry. They were the biggest members of, the public called it the money trust. Mm, yeah. you know, I, it was fun because during those days we didn't have the internet when I was doing research. Right. So a lot of this stuff I had to get from the um, Los Angeles library. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where well, you find it there, these big boxes, they're microfilm readers. Mm -hmm. And you get these rolls of microfilm, uh, microfilm of six, 35 millimeters wide. Right. You just bring them in and you turn the crank and the light comes down and you're looking at all these pages of the New York Times or the Washington Post going whizzing. <laughs> it's like you're a god and you're yeah. looking at the history moving by. You know, <laughs> zing, zing, zing. And I... Every time I could spot an um, editorial comment coming along, it would be, break the grip of the money trust. And zinc, back it up. Oh, yeah, there it is. The cry over and over again was, break the grip of the money trust. Mm -hmm. So they, the public and some of the politicians of the day were calling this the money trust. And this was what this 
legislation was supposed to break. Mm. And yet here were the members of the money trust being the ones writing the legislation. So who was there? The, uh, all the representatives of the, uh, of the money trust. Uh, there was um, Abraham Piat Andrew. He was the one that, who was apparently the assistant secretary of the uh, state, mm -hmm. of the treasury, rather. But he has an interesting story. He was one of the guys that went to Moscow mm. uh, on behalf of the banking interest, with, literally with suitcases full of money. Wow. And during the Bolshevik Revolution. Ah. And they were buying up the revolutionary movement. Wow. They actually were the major, one of the, probably the major financiers of, of Lenin. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of the implications that saying, you know, that, that these bankers um, and the, the, the Federal Reserve, you know, by proxy, are the profiteers of wars when they occur. Of course. Because these wars have to be funded, and where are they going for the funding? Yes. So that's, is that one of the major that's, implications? Well, it's one of them. You bet it is, because yeah. uh, this was a formula that was developed by the Rothschilds in mm -hmm. Europe uh, long ago. They found out that the financing both sides of a war, mm -hmm. both sides, was very, very profitable, because <laughs> no matter which side won, yeah. uh, you got your interest. Right. And it was outrageous interest, because when you're a, a, a ruler... Mm -hmm of a country, you don't care what it costs to win the war. That's right. Because you're going to get the money from the people eventually. Right. Interest rates are not important. It's get the money. Right. So you can hire the armies, mm. build the factories, get the munitions, uh, and so forth. So yeah, it, war is very, very profitable. And it's interesting because war is funded by private dollars then in that respect. Yes. And there are profiteers of wars when they occur. It's not just, oh, the government's saying we're gearing up, it, the, the, the funding's coming against mm -hmm. funneled from that place. I don't think most people recognize that. No, I didn't recognize it either till I got into that study. So there's so many layers to be exposed when you dig into the power of money. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, when you think about it, money is at the heart of almost every transaction in human experience. And that doesn't make money bad. Money merely happens to be that serve that function. Money can be used to serve good as well as evil, right. but it sure has been used to serve evil purposes. So has the Federal Reserve, through its actions in, in you know, the research that you've done, has it somehow turned us into like these indentured slaves or servants? Uh, like, you know, Does it keep us in a predicament that causes us to constantly feed it that monster? That's a very harsh way of putting it, but you know, Patrick, I would say it's a very accurate way. <laughs> I mean, when you clear yeah. away all the gentlemanly language to right. it, yeah, we become indentured servants to this system. Because I've seen various uh, numbers over the years, and I don't know which is accurate, but here's, this, here's what I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. People have attempted to find out how much of our lives do we spend earning money that goes to taxes mm -hmm. and interest right. on loans. Now, just in your own mind, I don't know what that number is, but I'm sure it's over 50%. Well over, for yeah. sure, yeah. Half of our lives, and it could be well over that, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of hidden taxes we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And uh, interest on loans, when you think, you know, you build a house and uh, so forth, and you, let's just say the house is worth, uh, just take a round figure, $100,000. And you subtract the value of the land and the and the value of the of the uh, building materials, the nails and the wood and the shingles and so forth, and and the labor, and you put all that up, it's going to be in the range of about uh, thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and all the rest is interest mm. on money that didn't even exist when it was loaned. And does this tie into inflation? And, that know, is the engine of inflation, so, of course. So, <laughs> so this is the engine of inflation. And, mm -hmm. and as you're saying, so inflation is almost a tool used by the bankers to kind of perpetuate their, their scheme here. Oh, it's definitely a tool. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great mechanism to extract. Can you talk extract. about that a little bit? Well, sure. First of all, what is inflation? It's just the expansion of the money supply mm -hmm. at a rate greater than the expansion of goods and services that offset it. Mm -hmm. Now, if money was something that took human effort to produce, mm -hmm. like gold mm -hmm. or silver mm -hmm. or anything else mm -hmm. that people have to make with human effort, then the quantity of that money would expand or contract mm -hmm. the same way any other good 
would expand or contract, depending on the demand for it. Right. Because it would be the motive for people to produce it, to go out and dig the gold out of the ground and mm -hmm. refine it. So it takes, it's hard to do. Right. So that is why whenever in history, when money was gold or silver, and there have only, <laughs> only been a few little narrow pieces in history where that's happened, right. but in those periods of history, the purchasing power has remained constant, mm -hmm. very constant over thousands of years. But when you break the money supply away from human effort and just say, well, let's vote on it. Right. How much money are we going to create now? Then, no surprise to anybody, the supply of money goes up, up and up, because especially when the banks create more money, that means they can lend more money. Mm -hmm. That means they can collect more interest on their loans, and mm -hmm. that's how they make their profit, is on interest on loans. And right. so if you restrict the amount of money that a bank has to lend, you're restricting their income. That's why banks always say, gold and silver is a terrible thing. We've got to have a flexible currency yeah. for you folks. It's for your own benefit. And this is the so-called fiat currency, the where fiat it's currency. not tied to anything. Not yeah. tied to anything. Right. It's just this formula that you decide. Let's make it three to one. Oh, mm. how about four to one? No, nine to one. Right. You know, it, right. it, you vote on it. Right. So when the supply of money does increase, as it always does in a fiat system mm -hmm. like that, at a rate faster than the supply of goods and services, then naturally the individual units of the dollars buy less and less of it. Right. And so that's inflation. It's not really hard to understand. And the only way to prevent inflation is to uh, limit the money supply and, or gear it. And the only way you can really limit it is to gear it to something that takes human effort. If you say, well, we're just going to be disciplined mm -hmm. and we're going to be really good guys and we won't increase the money supply, then... Um, it doesn't work. I've never seen that discipline. There aren't that many good, there aren't that many good guys no. out there when the temptation of huge money is... Uh, but now what this means to me as a, as a worker uh, in that system, you know, so I, and a producer and a taxpayer, uh, is that if I work and I uh, accumulate uh, you know, some amount of money or wealth, and I'm holding on to it, saying, hey, I want to, I want to earn and compile. Mm -hmm. But now these people can just sort of, like you say, raise their hand, vote, uh, increase supply, and suddenly this money is devalued. So all this work, and I've already paid taxes, I've already you know, done all the mm -hmm. other things, the, the interest mm -hmm. rates I've had to mm -hmm. pay, and, and next thing you know, I'm sitting here saying, geez, I don't have much left. Who got this money? <laughs> you know, exactly. Where did the value get transferred mm -hmm. to? Yeah. You know, if I had this much mm -hmm. money and it was had this much value on a given date and time, but then the value of that money got transferred out of my uh, possession and into somebody else's, and that's sort of the perplexing thing. And, and I think what you've identified is that, that that got transferred, that wealth got transferred to these bankers. Exactly. It didn't just disappear. No. It didn't go up to heaven. Right. It, it went to the banks, right. to the bankers, and to the politicians, who, who were the first ones in line for the benefit of that. Because the, they're the ones that get the first flood of money. Mm -hmm. you know, it's usually called a loan or something right. like that. So they raise the, the national debt. Right. And like when they bail out the banks, that's an interesting subject we may come God, back to. That. Yeah, well, that's... Here yeah. the banks are really bailing out themselves, but yeah. they got to get Congress involved to approve to it. To approve it. Yeah. But anyway, so when they create these billions and billions of dollars just like raising their hand, mm -hmm. um, where does that go? It goes to the banks. Right. Or it goes to some corporation, worthy corporation. Why? Because they owe it to the banks. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why the only reason the corporations are getting these loans or these bailouts is so they can continue to pay interest on their loans to the banks. Right. If it weren't for that, nobody would care about corporations. Right. It's always, this is a system of the banks, for the banks, by the banks, and of the banks. So the whole thing is rigged. Yeah. It is rigged, yeah. yeah. That's why I said your statement a moment ago sounded a little bit uh, rough, but yeah. it was pretty accurate. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, it's it's highly disturbing because obviously these are uh, somewhat complex issues and they're not really taught as a part of the regular education for no, you know the average no American that's going through this, the, the educational system. Matter of fact, this, that the educational system was designed to turn these people into factory workers to go to work every day to keep mm -hmm. feeding mm -hmm. this inflationary you know, system that benefits these bankers, and uh, and then of course you know when the, when all else fails, a good war will do, right? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent fallback. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I feel like sometimes as I'm, I get deeper understanding.
understanding when I was you know reading your book it, it made me kind of sense that like I, I feel like a hamster on the treadmill and you know I, I'll keep running faster and faster but I'm never getting off well that's the whole idea yeah that's the whole idea uh, I, I published a little chart you may remember mm -hmm. I looked at, I looked at these numbers and I thought what did they mean over a lifespan a little three a little three percent inflation a year doesn't sound bad four percent four and a half. 5%, okay, we'll hold it at 5%. That doesn't hurt anything, does it? Mm. And yet when you track that on a chart and you go 5% this year, 5% including the previous 5%, yeah, and it project it out, over the working span of the average person, over about 60 or 70 years, over the lifespan mm -hmm. of, a, of an average person, the uh, these people have stolen 97% of everything you have saved. Wow. Over a lifetime. Wow. And that's it. And you saved after taxes. After taxes, yeah. <laughs> if you put that in, they probably got it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, somewhat uh, incomprehensible. You know, and it, in, in a sense, we're boiled frogs, right? We're born into it, so mm -hmm. we don't really question it. Yeah. It's just like, you know, it's just the way things are. Well, th yeah, we don't question it. Exactly. Yeah. That's what they want. That's why we don't have a monetary educational system that teaches all these things. Right. Uh, they, they teach the kids uh, how to borrow responsibly. That's right. the word. I saw an ad after the crash in 2008, all the banks were begging for money, all right. the banks were bankrupt. Right. And the Bank of America, I think it was, put an ad on television. They had the audacity to offer a booklet to young people, how to borrow responsibly. It's a, oh and they were the worst people in the world to be talking about that because they were bankrupt. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's a bit uh, hypocritical, yeah. wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, that's like a, a, a whiskey company saying, drink responsibly. <laughs> and they try to do that in commercials. They do that. <laughs> they do that. <laughs> and we're not supposed to we want it, We want to sell as much of this as we can, but we want you to be responsible. <laughs> it's pathetically humorous yes wow so now the idea though is people say well we, we, we couldn't function without a federal reserve so if we if you could wave a magic wand and make the federal reserve disappear tomorrow what does the world look like well the world would uh, look a lot better than it does now now that doesn't mean there wouldn't be some problems because unfortunately we've just said that nobody understands money they mm -hmm. don't understand these basic issues and mm -hmm. so there would be chaos mm -hmm. not because the, the system was changing for the better but because people wouldn't know how to live under such a system right that's the basic problem it's up here it's right. not in the wallet so much so what it would look like is that banks would continue to do just about everything that they want to mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. with one exception they wouldn't be allowed to lie. <laughs> they wouldn't be protected right. by the government. Right. They wouldn't be bailed out. They would be treated like any other business. They'd be accountable. They'd be accountable, yes. yes. That's all that would be required. We don't have to get rid of banks. They mm. serve a great function. Sure. If they didn't have this protection to be deceitful and to rob people, that's and, all. Are there any practical measures, uh, you know, people can take to sort of compensate for the predicament that, that we're all forced into with this Federal Reserve as far as how, you know, what they can do with their money, um, you know, how to maybe mitigate the appropriation of their mm -hmm. money, yeah. of their hard-earned dollars that yeah. should be theirs. To try and protect themselves a yes. little bit from this chaos that we see around us. Well, yes, there is. I look at this in a sort of a two-phase uh, view. There's the short term and the long term. Mm -hmm. In the short term, uh, we can't think about changing very much because this is a, uh, we, we need to turn the locomotive around mm -hmm. and head back the other way. But right now it's going down the track with a lot of momentum. Right. And we know we got to slow it down mm -hmm. and then maybe back it up. You can't right. just bingo, stop it. So for a little while, we're stuck on mm -hmm. this train moving mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. So what do we do mm -hmm. under those circumstances? Well, the first thing is to recognize that the national currencies of the world are fiat currencies. They're not backed by anything of intrinsic value. Therefore, they will in inflate or they will deflate in their purchasing power mm -hmm. and prices will inflate. Right. So since we know that, why on earth would we want to keep our savings and our wealth mm -hmm. in national currencies or anything that represents national currencies. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Right. So the first logical, intelligent thing to do is 
take whatever whatever wealth, little bit or a lot we may have, anything over and above our our daily activities with a little reserve for bumps along the road, and get it out of fiat currencies. Mm. That doesn't mean I'm giving any advice as to where to put them because right. I'm not smart enough to know what's best for you or any, anybody right. else. But there are any place else would, would almost be, any place else would be better than having them in currencies that you know that every day with every tick of the clock it's mm-hmm. losing its purchasing power. Right. So it's like standing on the train track and we see the headlight coming, folks. First thing to do, get off the track. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then we can talk about that. Makes a lot some of, of these other things. Yeah. But the question of what do you do with the money is not so easy, and that right. de- that depends a lot on the individual. Uh, The only general rule of thumb is it should be something that has intrinsic value Mm -hmm. that people want Mm -hmm. and it will last a long time. Right. Uh, And, uh, of course, now you're getting into the evaluation of what is the good form of money because anything can be used for money if it has intrinsic value and so forth. You might consider uh, buying gold or silver. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, then you have to worry about uh, who's going to guard your gold and silver. Right. So every investment opportunity you can think of has its challenges. There's and no those markets perfect. can get manipulated the, too. Everything yeah. gets messed yeah. up easily yeah. Yeah. by yeah. the experts. And so whatever. You, I'm glad you brought that up because no matter what you do, you better become an expert on it yourself. That's right. Don't depend on somebody to come in and tell you what they're selling. Right. Now, they may be perfectly uh, reputable, you know, honest people, but they're going to be biased in favor of what they know or what they have to sell. Right. It might be real estate. Mm -hmm. It might be a warehouse full of cheap white wine. I don't know. But, I mean, (laughs) everybody's got to figure that out for themselves. But get off the track because fiat money is going down, down, down every day. Yeah. Now, that's the short-term view. The long-term view is more challenging Mm -hmm. because I don't think there is any way that we can survive in the long term unless we change this system. Right. Eventually this creature is going to grow and grow and grow and get a bigger portion of our lives and a bigger portion of it until finally they have it all. Mm -hmm. So if we're not willing to just sit back and say, well, let's live as best we can Mm -hmm. while in the time we have left, a lot of people take that view. If you have that crusader gene Mm -hmm. that I have and you have, and many people have, you can't just sit here and take this. You've got to do something. Well, that means we've got to change this system. We've got to become active. We've got to become uh, responsible in, in the political field. We have to talk about it to our friends. We right. have to create a movement based on understanding, and this isn't easy. No. But we have to do it. No, well, that's uh, Revealed Film's uh, statement of purpose is we make movies that make movements, and that, that's it's the heavy. whole point. That's the whole point. Is that yeah. kind of activism, uh, I think, is, is required. And there has to be a reckoning at some point. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's funny. When I talk to people and friends of mine, even, that are economists, and, you know, you talk, I talk about the debt, and they're like, oh, the debt's no big deal. <laughs> you know, I'm like, uh, you know, $20 trillion, you know, well, look at all the wealth that we have and the wealth's going to expand and, you know, servicing that debt is only this much money. I said, what happens if interest rates go up? Oh, that could be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're saying, everything you say is true, but we're doing well, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that response. Look, that's look, it. Look how well we're, we're yeah, doing. Look, but we're, it's not the point. My, my, my kids are born, they're, 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 you know, a portion of their life, a large yeah. portion is already mortgaged before they're even brought into the yeah. world. Yeah. And it, it, so nobody looks at that as being, you know, a morally criminal thing, <laughs> you right. know, to do to a human being, you know. So, uh, I, you know, to me, it's, it's very disturbing. Now, I have uh, another friend of mine, uh, wise, uh, you know, person who's been around a long time, and he would say, uh, as I was getting some projects, he said, you know, sometimes you got to be careful whose rice bowls you're going to break. And, <laughs> and uh, in your case, you really uh, called out very publicly a lot of very powerful people who have very mm. large rice bowls, you know, so yes, to speak. Yes. What was the backlash for you after the release of this book? Well, it wasn't nearly what I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. I thought that uh, I would probably come under a lot of attack, mm-hmm. and I overestimated the my ability to reach a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I know how the opposition works mm-hmm. now, and if I'd thought about it, I would have realized that uh, what happened, which was not much, mm-hmm was according to formula. Mm -hmm. Um, These people with the big rice bowls, as Mm -hmm. you say, they they do have a formula. Mm -hmm. 
and you can spot it over and over again. And the first thing is that if they have opposition, mm -hmm. they ignore it. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, that's all they have to do because it'll go away. Right. They have the, the money, mm -hmm. the power, the media, the influence. and you have just an idea. Mm -hmm or maybe a book or something like that. But if nobody reads the book, mm -hmm. you're a flash in the pan. You don't have the resources to continue and, and pose a serious threat. So they just ignore it, it goes away. So that's the first thing that happened to me. They ignored me. Mm -hmm. they, I thought, well, isn't this interesting? I got kind of uh, upset by that. Like, yeah. Come on. What? You, you were hoping <laughs> to get the attention and, and they're smart enough not to give you the they're attention. They're smart enough not to do that. Mm -hmm. Now the next phase, of course, is uh, on their part is uh, to demonize mm -hmm. you. And I have begun to see a little bit of that happen because uh, they will try and, as more people get this message, my message and yours too, they will demonize us. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, those people are racists mm -hmm. or uh, they're crackpots mm -hmm. or they're fascists or they owe taxes or they, conspiracy molest, theories. they molest little children. Yeah. They, yeah, they have these conspiracy theories, ha, 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 right. things like that. And uh, unfortunately, m many of the people in the world will believe it because they read it in the newspaper. That's right. And that's usually pr pretty effective. Mm -hmm. That eliminates most of their opposition. Mm -hmm. I don't know what lies in store for me, but my crusader gene will not allow me to stop <laughs> All right. I know what lies ahead, right. and, and I, foolishly, I'm trying as hard as I can to put me a little closer to the target. Uh, because if we don't win this war, it won't make any difference. It won't make any difference. Right. We'll lose everything. So we have no option. We have to fight, and we have to win. So uh, any final thoughts that you might have before we, uh, before we tie up as far as what you think people need to know that we haven't spoken about? Well, I don't know whether it's a final thought, it's just a, another thought, another and that thought. is that we talk about problems in the world. We talk about problems in the monetary system. Every, we, everywhere we look, we've got, oh, look at this, this is horrible, this is happening to us. We're living in a really a wonderful time right now because in spite of all of those problems, we have the means of communication mm -hmm. and research to discover what they are, and with the ability to get organized and build movements, as you say, mm -hmm we can create a movement to actually reverse this if we really want to do it. And the encouraging thing is we don't need a lot of people to do it. No. I, at one point, had the view that we had to reach 51%, right? The democratic view. We win the vote, and then we can do anything we want to. <laughs> right. And then I got a little smarter as I started to reread history. I recognized that history has always been determined by a minority, yeah. and an extreme minority, 3% or less. Right. It's certainly true in the American Revolution. Yep. Less than 3% were active in the Revolution. Most of them were waiting to see who was going to win. Right, right. And it's a hard thing to say, but it's true. Yeah. And even those that were in the Revolution weren't quite sure what its orientation was. It was just a small group of people like Jefferson and Adams and yeah. you know, Madison and Washington, yeah. who set the pace. It was probably less than 20 people, yeah. 20 people in the continental area of the United States that were the leaders and motivators of the whole American Revolution. Right. So, and l probably 1% of the farmers out there were fighting and willing to sacrifice, put their lives on the line, but they were following their leaders and right. so forth. This is the way society really works. So all we have to do, Patrick, is reach that little 1% or less of the population who are willing to dedicate their lives to this thing mm -hmm. and put the story out in a plausible way, in a reasonable way to explain it and to show the pros and the cons. And then larger numbers will follow along. Yeah. You know the old song, give me some men who are stout-hearted, and I'll soon give you 10,000 more. Right. That's how it works. Right. And so that's the encouraging part. We're living in a great period of history, and we have a wonderful opportunity with the tools of communication that we have to really make a difference in the world. Well, I appreciate you uh, lighting the torch here and uh, helping to make a, a bigger dent in that 1%. And uh, your work has been something that has uh, made a difference in a lot of lives, in a lot of people's lives that you'll never know or never meet. But I'm happy that I'm one of the ones you didn't know that I've met you today. So wow. th thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Patrick. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.